Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Hear the word of God from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. This reading comes from the New Revised Standard Version and can be found on page 882 in the Pew Bible. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to him, Sir, If you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Yep. (laughs) And that's part of the problem. Because apparently you all already know the good news before I even shared it. The truth of the matter is, you know what this day is all about. We wouldn't be gathering here on this morning if Jesus were still in the tomb. There would be no reason to have Easter if the resurrection weren't real. You all already know the news. So it does beg the question, what possible surprise could there be on a day like today? In fact, by the time we get to John's version of the Easter gospel that Sue just read for us, we've already heard it. We had to get through Matthew and Mark and Luke to get there. And they've already shared the news with us. Jesus is alive. He wasn't in the tomb. He has been raised. The resurrection is real. And so we might beg the question of John. John, what possible surprise could you have for us today? What news could there be that we haven't heard this morning? Is it still possible for God to surprise us? 
Well, John would want us to believe that there is. Regardless of how many Easter services you have been to, regardless of how many Easter mornings you have gone through in your life, God would want us to hold out the possibility that there is still room for a surprising word for you and for me today. The thing is, John, in his version of the gospel, is really interested in delaying exactly what that surprise is supposed to be. Because by the time we get to the Easter story in John chapter 20, John has changed a little in his narrative style. He has gone from being a gospel writer to a mystery writer. All of a sudden, he becomes Agatha Christie or a screenwriter for CSI, or Law and Order. The setting for the mystery in John 20, of course, is the empty tomb, the place where they laid Jesus' body just a few days before. And the first detective to appear on the scene is Nancy Drew, played by Mary Magdalene. And she discovers the first bit of evidence Exhibit A, the stone has been rolled away. That, that giant stone that they used to seal the entrance to the tomb, to keep people from, from getting into it, had been rolled away. Catches Nancy Drew, Mary Magdalene, by surprise, so she, she runs back home and fetches backup detectives. And so the first backup detective, Columbo, shows up. <laughs> played perfectly by Simon Peter, as well as another detective, another disciple. Now, we never really find out his name, who the other disciple is, but we can fairly assume that it was John, the gospel writer himself, given the way that this second detective is described as, quote, the one whom Jesus loved. (laughs) And a few verses later, the one who could run faster than Peter. (laughs) I guess if you're writing a gospel for yourself, you get to describe yourself any way you want to. (laughs) So anyway, John pokes his head into the tomb and he finds exhibit B, the second piece of evidence. He finds the burial linens that had been used to drape the body of Jesus were lying flat in the tomb without a body present. And then Peter sticks his head in the tomb and he finds exhibit C. He sees the head linen that was used to shroud the face of Jesus rolled up neatly in another part of the tomb. Three unmistakable bits of evidence. They're laying the case before you. And you would think that it would be that this moment that the surprise would be up, that the great news would be revealed. There is nothing else to say. We would think at this moment that the resurrection would become plain and clear to the disciples. At least that's the way it would be if we were reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But not here. John is not quite ready yet to give us the big reveal. In fact, in his Gospels, in his Gospel, despite all the evidence, Mary and Peter and John come to exactly the wrong conclusion. That they come to the conclusion that the body of Jesus has been stolen. Talk about a double whammy. This would be the worst possible explanation. Because not only will they have just gone through the grief of saying goodbye to Jesus on Good Friday, now they've got the second layer of complication of having to come face to face with this epic scandal of the theft of his body. Poor Mary. Mary not only has lost Jesus once to death, now now she has lost Jesus a second time in grief. And that's why, long before John is even ready to share the news of the resurrection, he wants to be very clear about what Mary was feeling. Right there in verse 11, we are told that Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. 
The next thing that happens is two angels appear. Two angels appear. And we would rightfully think that once the angels appear, that's when the surprise is going to be up. I mean, that's the way it would be in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I mean, when the angels are there, they're the ones to say, do not fear, he's not there, he's gone ahead of you, the resurrection is real. But not in John's gospel. In John's gospel, the angels appear not to reveal the resurrection, but to confirm Mary's grief. They ask her, woman, why are you weeping? And she says to them, because they have stolen away the body of my Lord. Why? Why is John so reluctant to stretch out the suspense? Why is he so interested in sharing this mystery with us? Just get right to the good news. I mean, clearly you all already know it. But maybe, maybe John wants to push the brakes for a second not only to allow this story to breathe, but to allow you and me to find ourselves in it. Maybe John is saying to all of us this morning that if you look carefully, if you, if you listen carefully to what's happening here, you will find yourself standing right there next to Mary. Right here this morning. I can't, I can't possibly know all of the various stories and situations that you bring into the sanctuary or with you in Chapel Overflow or watching online today. All I know is that many of us, if not most of us, also feel like something has been stolen from us. Ask yourself the question, do you feel like your life has been stolen by your fears and in your, your anxieties about financial trouble or an uncertain future or, or an unbreakable addiction. Maybe we feel like our relationships have been stolen away from us by, by bitterness, by resentment, by betrayal, by a reluctance to forgive. Maybe we all feel like our innocence has been stolen as young people fear for their lives from gun violence, as our planet tremors at the lack of care, as our world leaders are caught in an endless cycle of one-upsmanship and an addiction to violence and power. Maybe, maybe you feel like your future has been stolen by your past. Maybe you feel too gripped by shame and guilt or things that you should not have done, or second-guessing, or wishful thinking. Or maybe the worst thing of all, maybe you feel like your life has been stolen away by death. As you come to this place grieving the loss of a loved one, or even confronting your own mortality. Oh, John, John is not itchy to give us the big reveal yet, because he wants us to stand there with Mary at the empty tomb and acknowledge just how dark that first Easter started out to be. It's no wonder that Mary stood outside the tomb weeping because she could more easily believe in theft than in resurrection. And so can we. I really like John's gospel. I really like his version of the Easter story because before he gets to the good stuff, he acknowledges how hard the stuff of life really is. <laughs> and then the gardener shows up. At least, at least Mary thinks it's the gardener. We, we know full well that it's Jesus. He just shows up out of the blue, right there, face to face with Mary, but Mary doesn't know it. And that's part of John's point, too. Because, because John would acknowledge that whatever we're feeling right now, with whatever our human condition is, it's natural and it's okay. But all of those fears and anxieties that we have could also blind us to the reality of the resurrection, 
We could be so engulfed in our darkness, as understandable as that might be right now, we could be so engulfed in darkness that we would not even notice the light if it were standing right there next to us. And so Mary looks at Jesus and doesn't even know he's, he's Jesus. And, and not only does he think, not only does she think he's the gardener, she thinks he's the thief. Because Jesus says, hey woman, why are you weeping? And, and Mary says, sir, if you know where they have taken the body of my Lord, please tell me so I may carry him away. She thought Jesus carried his own body away from the tomb. Mary had hit the lowest point of her life. Just like many of us, perhaps, are in this place right now, feeling like we are at the lowest point of our lives too. So blinded by the darkness, so engulfed by our suffering, that we cannot possibly believe in any possibility of new life, new hope, and resurrection. And it is there. It is there in that moment when Mary was at the lowest of the low that John finally decides it is time. It's time for the big reveal. It's time to share that the resurrection is real. The news that we all knew would come, the news that we all knew would bring us here to this place, the part that we all come here to hear this morning, excited to hear, finally arrives a full 15 verses into the gospel story. But here's the surprising thing, is the way that John decides to reveal that news. Not, not with a thunderous earthquake, not with angels speaking from on high, not from God speaking from the heavens, not with the sound of trumpets. If you want all that stuff, if you all want all of that drama and special effects, you can find that in Matthew and Mark and Luke. But if you want to hear it in John, you have to listen carefully. Because the surprise this morning is the way that God shared the news with Mary and the way God shares the news with you. Jesus himself says one word that makes all the difference. He speaks her name. Mary. And it was at that moment when Mary heard God speak her name, the fog lifted, the darkness vanished, and for the first time in a long time she knew that she was found. Her life might have felt lost and confused, but God had found her. And that is the surprising news for us today. This Easter, the good news for you this morning is that God will stop at nothing to find you. God is in the search and rescue business and this morning, even though you have felt lost and in the dark and blinded by your grief and fear, listen, God is calling you by name and you have been found. Two Saturdays ago, on an early Saturday morning, I was sitting on one of my favorite places in the country on a beach chair overlooking Pasigro Beach in St. Petersburg. I had a cup of coffee, I had my laptop computer, and I had a prayer that God would give me some inspiration for what to say on Easter morning. And that inspiration came a few minutes after I sat down. Into my view, walking right along the shoreline, walked a woman who was carrying a metal detector in her hands. You've seen people like this before. There she was with this fancy little gadget, just sweeping the sand left and right, listening for the beeps. Every once in a while, she would stop. She would pull out her big strainer basket. She would hunch down and scoop up a big chunk of sand and start sifting. I watched the people had lost. I... I then watched her do something amazing. Couldn't believe it when I saw her do this. When she was right in front of my line of sight, no more than 20 feet right in front of me on the beach, she stopped 
and she pulled off what appeared to be her wedding ring. Probably the most valuable possession she had on her in that moment. And she closed her eyes and she turned her head and she threw the ring down onto the sand without, with enough force to bury that ring down below the surface. I couldn't believe it. And then I watched her pick up that metal detector again. And it was then that I realized that what she was doing was making sure that her metal detector was working properly. And that she was so intent on finding all of the other lost treasure out on the beach that she was willing to give up her most prized possession just to make sure that her system of search and rescue was working properly. And it was then at that moment that I thought to myself, thank you, God, I have an Easter sermon illustration. <laughs> because since the beginning of human history, God has been on a search and rescue mission, searching for every lost soul, searching for every person who's been wandering in the dark, searching for every person who has been standing outside their tomb, weeping, weeping, weeping. And God has been so intent on finding every single lost one of us that God was willing, God was even willing on Good Friday to let go of the most prized possession that God had, God's very own self and his son, Jesus Christ. And there he was on Good Friday where God threw Jesus down into the earth and buried him buried him in a tomb, buried him in the sand of human condition to take on all of the lostness and darkness that we feel. And then on Easter morning, God took out that strainer basket. And when God raised Jesus to new life, it proved that God could find anyone and anything, including you. I kept watching that woman. After she slipped her wedding ring back on her finger, she picked up that metal detector again. And I watched her walk a few more steps, sweeping back and forth. And then all of a sudden she heard a beep. And she stopped. She picked up that strainer basket, scooped up a chunk of sand, started sifting, and she found something. I don't know what she found. I really wanted to walk up to her and ask. <laughs> but I couldn't find a non-creepy way <laughs> to say, hey lady, I've been watching you for 10 minutes. Um, what'd you find? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Because something that was lost has been found. And this is why John tells us his version of the Easter Gospel. Because with one word, with one utterance of Mary's name, Mary, who was lost, had been found. Surprise! Because that very same God, that very same Jesus, right now, is speaking your name Two. Might be hard for you to hear it. You are deafened by your trouble. You are blinded by your darkness. But if you listen carefully, this morning, unmistakably, plainly, and clearly, God is speaking your name and you have been found. And so the only question that we need to answer now is what are we going to do about it? What difference will it make to be found by God? It's interesting, if you look at what Mary said next, Mary responded with another word, rabbi, which John would remind us means teacher. It was in that moment that Mary recognized that because she has been found, she has a lot of lessons to learn from Jesus, and so do you and I. 
In fact, we want to give you a very practical way to take something home with you this Easter. If you have felt far away from God at all, if you have felt lost, then one of the best ways for you to experience what it means to be found by God is to read the Bible diligently, daily, regularly. And we want to give you a tool this morning to do just that. Right now, on our website, hydeparkumc.org slash 31 days is a very simple and clear reading plan that you can follow starting today that will track you through the next 31 days and guide you into the most important stories of the life of Jesus. And that reading plan is accompanied by wonderful questions every single day that you can answer for yourself that will allow you to go deeper into not only the meaning of the stories, but what they might mean for you. And when you get past those 31 days, on day 31, there are next steps for you to follow, to go even deeper in your spiritual life, to recalibrate your life according to God's will, and to grow in your spiritual maturity in and through the ministries and relationships of this church. If you felt lost, listen for God to speak your name, and follow this reading plan, and we hope to see you back. Mary's response to Jesus was to say, Rabbi, teacher, I've got so much more to learn from you. Hers was a realization that she had so much more to learn, and Jesus had so much more to teach her, and I, to teach her, and I want you to know, despite your doubts, it is not too late for you regardless of your standing in life or how small your faith might appear to be, it is not too late for you to grow in your faith and follow Jesus, your teacher and your Lord. This is the good news that we knew had to be coming eventually. The other Gospels would want us to hear it a lot sooner. The other Gospels share the news right away at the top of their stories. If I were preaching Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this sermon would probably only be about five minutes long. We could end this service and beat the Baptist to brunch. <laughs> but it's a good thing we heard from John today. Because John would want us to acknowledge that it's good to be found. And it's good to hear God speak our name. Because then, now, and from now on, we can believe exactly what Mary said. I have seen the Lord. Let us pray together. God, this is good news. We were expecting it. We just weren't expecting how much we needed to hear it or the way in which you were going to share it. So God, thank you for speaking it to us in the most personal way possible through the speaking of our names. God, we confess to you that we have felt in the dark, lost, confused, blinded. But today, the message is unmistakable. You have found us. You have given up your most prized possession to find us. And for that, we are grateful. Now continue to guide us as we take whatever the next step is along our journey of faith so that every day can be a resurrection day, that every pulse, heartbeat of our life can speak to the glory of hallelujah. You are risen and you raise us to new life indeed. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and let all God's people say, Amen. And so, in response to God's word this morning, we offer the fullness of our lives and our commitments to Jesus in the form of our tithes, our offerings, and our connection cards as we invite the ushers to come forward.